Hello and welcome to day two of the BFI Future Film Festival 2022. Uh, if you haven't noticed, the festival this year is bigger than ever before. It's fully hybrid, taking place online and also at the BFI South Bank in London. All the online events uh, like this one are free, so please do uh, come back again and check out more. My name's Kim and I'm a programmer for BFI South Bank and I was so thrilled when the BFI Future Film Festival asked me to host this hotspot with Romola Garai. Romola Garai is a BAFTA nominated and a Golden Globe nominated actor whose career has spanned film, television, theatre, uh, but she's also a filmmaker and her recent film Amulet has been released into UK cinemas. So please don't go anywhere because I'm hoping Romola will be able to share with us lots of advice from both behind and in front of the camera. Hello Romola, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. Oh, the pleasure is all ours. Um, now, I mentioned in the intro that you've obviously had this fantastic career. It's gone into lots of different spaces. But if it's OK with you, I'd really like to start at the beginning um, and ask you, when did you know that you wanted to be an actor? I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> what a terrible place to start. I didn't really know. I was not very academic at school but I really liked reading and watching films. Uh, and I suppose I was what they called the kind of creative child. But I had a teacher at school um, who was a drama teacher, but she also gave like one-on-one -on -one, um, drama, speech and drama lessons. And she was amazing. She was called Mrs. McEwen. And there was a local comp sort of area competition for acting and drama. Uh, I, I grew up uh, in the West Country and some, so she would take me for one on one lessons and I would do these kinds of competitions and I would sometimes win for like acting. But I mean, I was really young, like eight, nine, ten years old. So I knew that that was something that I like, you know, if I had something that I was good at, it was that. Um, but no one in my family was in the industry. I didn't know any actors or writers or filmmakers or anyone. It was completely beyond anything that I really sort of knew and understood in a professional capacity. Um, so it wasn't until many years later, until after I'd actually had an opportunity to go into the industry that I had to sort of sit down and think, is that like what I want to do with my life? You were in the National Youth Theatre, right, from quite an, an, an early age. How did that come about? So that was a continuation of this 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 teacher that I had because I you can't you can't um, audition to enter until you're 14. And so I was sort of coming up to my 14th birthday and she said, you should have a go. It's really competitive. It's hard to get in, but you should do the audition. And I had the amazing advantage of having done some of the Lambda uh, uh, grades before so I understood what it was like to just go into a room and have to recite a poem or do a piece of acting on your own like I wasn't going into the audition for National Youth Theatre without ever having done that before and I think that was a huge advantage and I think also because I was so young everyone said well you won't get in so I wasn't as nervous as I think I would have been had I been a bit older and people were like this is your chance you know I was only 14 the first time I tried so you know pretty much my teacher said there's no way so I went in feeling quite relaxed, um, which I think was a help. And yeah, and I got in and I and I did the introductory course uh, when I was, yeah, the year that I turned 15, which was quite a lot younger than most of the other people on the course. And what was the experience on the course like? What sort of things did you end up doing? Well, for me, it was it was amazing, but it was a huge difference from anything that I had done in terms of acting before. Most of the other people in the course knew that they wanted to be actors. They were on already on that route towards uh, thinking about their drama school admissions. As I say, that was not the case with me. I'd gone from standing in a kind of Peter Pan collar, like a big collar, reciting poetry, like as a child, basically, to then, then being in an environment with teenagers who were much older than me like really who were very serious about becoming actors and that course was in incredible like we did everything we did movement work we did voice work we worked on texts we did accent work we did everything that you would do in a drama school in the space of you know four or five weeks um and you know I was away from home for the first time um so it was it was intense but it was it was uh, for me, that was the first time I really understood 
what being an actor was, what it entailed. It wasn't about presenting something to an audience. It was about going inside yourself and mining yourself for things that you, you know, are then using to interpret other people's work. It's, you know, part of the artistic process. It, that was for the first time that I really understood that. So even though you weren't always sure it was acting and then you, you got these great opportunities and you sort of followed this direction, uh, was it during that time that you thought, oh, you know, I, I could do this or I really want to do this? And was there anything that you found inspiring in terms of other actors or other performances that that you saw growing up? Yeah, I think the thing for me was that I was probably one of those children where like if you grow up and no one that you know is an actor, it is an actor. You don't know anybody in the industry. You have no connection with the industry at all. It's not that you don't want to, it's that it wouldn't occur to you to like become an actor. That's not something that anyone has ever asked you or you've ever thought about. I was taken to the theatre though. And I remember going to the theatre, uh, we would go to Bristol, we would go to Bath, um, Newbury sometimes because I'm from the West Country. And that was a big, uh, that was a big change uh, for me in terms of really like what kind of thing I was absorbing um so you know I was taken to see shopping and like the Mark Ravenhill play which was a national theatre tour when I was I don't know like a young teenager I saw the seagull an amazing production again that's national theatre production when I was quite young Chekhov famous Chekhov play and that made me understand that you know life was um you know, your decision to like go and to be in the arts really had to come from a love of story and storytelling and not really about performing for people. It was really about narrative and having a real like love for it and engagement with just telling stories and relating to people through stories. And I think that that was when I started to really understand that was going to go and see plays when I was quite young. Thank you. That's such a beautiful insight of like, you know, where that feeling needs to come from and what that, that feeling should be. Um, I'd love to go back to the sort of National Youth Theatre again, because you sort of answered this question a little bit when you said that you went into it with no expectations and that also sort of helped you uh, get through the, the audition. But do you have any advice for anyone who's considering auditioning for National Youth Theatre or applying for any sort of drama uh, community club group? Yeah, try and get some help with your audition pieces. I think going in cold is just asking an awful lot of yourself, you know, like if you've not had any help with your audition pieces from a drama teacher at school or from a local drama group, then if you don't get in, you're sort of going, well, I failed and you probably haven't failed. You probably just haven't had enough help. You just need a little bit of coaching sometimes, I think, whether that's watching people's audition pieces online or if you can just get, a, you know, another person in the room, like the drama department at your school or whatever, to just listen to your speeches and give you some pointers. I, I just think it, it, it's really, really helpful. Actors need feedback. You know, you have directors for a reason. Like nobody goes into an order. Like I run my pieces with my husband. Like before I was married, I would do them with my school, with my friends. You know, you need that kind of feedback. Um, and also I think you mustn't think that it's your only shot because most of the people that I was at National Youth, National Youth Theatre with had auditioned a few times. And now, like some of my best friends who are actors auditioned for drama school three or four times. I don't think it's helpful to think this is my shot. I think the first time that you go and audition for something like the National Youth Theatre, I think you should think about it as the beginning of a process. You know, like this is my first chance to audition and there will be another one and another one. And actually the best actors often mature because they're not going in and kind of, you know, I'm not necessarily sure that it was a good thing that I got in when I was so young. I'm not sure I was able to kind of get the best out of it because I was so young when I went. So much younger than everyone else on the course and just a bit immature maybe. I think it's good to have two or three goes at auditioning for something and then be at the right age and at the right point to, to get in. So don't put too much pressure on yourself to get it first time and try and get some help with your speeches. <laughs> Did you study anything else? Obviously you entered acting quite early, but did you go to university and was that useful? Yeah, I did. I, I actually, so I've been acting for a couple of years and then I, um, I finished my degree because I went to university for one year um, to read English 
but I am about sort of halfway through that year I sort of started getting acting work and then you know at the end of the year I left to 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 sort of become an actor full-time because I was getting lots of opportunities but then after a sort of few years of working in the industry I decided I wanted to finish my degree because I wasn't completely sure what I wanted to do whether I wanted to carry on acting or maybe do something else some other kind of part of the industry so I went back and I finished my degree uh, part-time on the Open University so I had two years left to do so it took four years <laughs> to finish it but I did finish it and it was actually probably that it was when I kind of got to the end of doing that I was I don't know 27 28 and that's I think when I had the free time to really think seriously about making a piece of work myself and that's probably the end of my degree is probably around about the time I started sort of thinking seriously about writing my short that's great that you kept it going uh even though your career was sort of taking off and probably absorbing a lot of your time it's great that you still got to finish it yeah I mean I, I was sort of generally thought of as being a, a massive swat <laughs> on the set because I was everyone else was kind of like having fun and eating custard creams and drinking cups of tea and I was sort of sat in the corner of the room with a gigantic book on like you know <laughs> P.S. Eliot or something um but it was really good for me because I think it really helped me uh I mean, it, it it sounds silly, but I had missed a lot of stuff. And so just something that you do at drama school or like if you read English or read theatre studies or any of those things is that you'll just get really good at analysing texts. So like reading a piece of dialogue and thinking about who wrote it and how they wrote it and what the influences are. I just had missed a lot of that stuff. So it was really, really useful for me to go back and do that. Great. Um, I wanted to ask you about, so your first professional role was in the television film, The Last of the Blonde Bombshells, where you played a young Judy Dench. Uh, how did that come uh, about for you? Did you have to audition for that part? Yeah, I did. I was at school and the drama teacher at the school had, um, uh, like, you know, particularly said, I think it's something that you should think about this. By this point, I was doing my A-levels. You should think about maybe, you know, becoming think about having it as a career or applying for drama schools or whatever and then he had uh, connections in the industry and there was a casting call for pe for somebody to play it was essentially a non-speaking role it was like flashbacks um in a television film where Judy Dench played the central character but there were these flashbacks to her when she was much younger and um yeah I went and I auditioned and and you know to my you, you know huge surprise but you know delight I got the part but I really had absolutely no idea at all what that was going to entail so you know when somebody called me up and was like you have to come here at 4.30 in the morning for hair and makeup. I was like, <laughs> why so early? That feels weird, <laughs> you know? Um, not understanding that that's like completely standard for filming and I didn't really understand what a call sheet was and I knew nothing about the kind of technical aspects of, of acting at all, hitting a mark, understanding where your light is, like working with another actor, taking notes. I knew nothing. So it was um, an amazing experience, but quite sort of terrifying as well and then also you had to have an agent contractually I think because I was still under 18 so you know then I had an I, I got I was introduced to an agent who took me on um, and then she kept calling me <laughs> and asking me <laughs> to go for auditions which I was sort of very confused by because I thought it was just a one-time deal you know that I'd go and do this job and um but yeah that it, it kind of uh it, it happened in that way which was very unusual but, you know, and I'm sort of, I always try and say this to people, like it wasn't necessarily, sounds like the dream come true, but it's not necessarily because people who go to drama school and audition to get into drama school have to work really hard to get there. And they have to know that that's what they want to do with their life. And that in a way kind of, you know, that seals the deal that makes, you know, you really have to go through the fire to get the job and like want know that that's what you want to do whereas I think I had kind of an more of an ambivalent relationship with it for a while which is not necessarily a good thing yeah and it must be tricky when you're sort of thrown in like that because you don't have the preparation like you say learning about hitting marks and call sheets and how that stuff work it's a lot to be thrown in the deep end without that without that knowledge yeah I had no idea I had no idea what to do or what was expected of me really and I think as well like particularly back then there was you know I was I was under 18 and I was on this film set and I didn't have a chaperone with me or anything because I think you had to be if you were over 16 it was okay uh I don't think that would happen now I think there would be much people would be much more sort of aware of like you know you might need looking after or you might need someone there with you yeah it was different 
Yeah. And what, so it sounds like obviously the, the sort of main advice would be, you know, too, too much too soon isn't always a good thing. And perhaps people who are interested in acting should definitely be sort of pacing themselves and not trying to, to perhaps do the sort of same pathway that you did. Yeah, I think, you know, if you go to drama school or if you, you know, decide to read English or drama or uh, at uni, then I think you go through a pr- process of, you know, maturing. You're you're deciding that's what you want to do. You're, you know, making your own work because often those those years are times where you can, you know, write or direct your own plays, you know, or to take things to festivals, be part of the university or uh, college um, drama society society and you know that that those are really important formative years where you you know make your own work you decide what kind of work you're interested in you often make a lot of friends at that time and those people become important creative collaborators in your life so I would say that that is not um that's not to be rushed through that period of time because I think there's a strong there's always this thing where like the younger you start the better the younger you start you but the better and I don't necessarily feel like that myself I think had I been given a few more years I think it would have been better for me and I think I would have had probably a better relationship with the work and that I made I mean I might have ended up deciding deciding to become a filmmaker earlier because maybe you know that's something that you know, happened to me later in my career. And actually, if I'd had a few more years at the beginning to kind of particularly socially to kind of relate to other people who are creative people, then I might have realized that maybe I love acting, but maybe I want to try and write and direct as well, which, you know, took a few years for, for to come about for me. Um, I'd like to come on to your filmmaking. But before we do, just sort of while we're still in the sphere of auditions, um, We've talked about kind of auditioning for National Youth Theatre and then and then your first part as well. Do you have any sort of general uh, advice for auditions? And in particular, these days, it feels like a lot of people are doing self-taping because that's sort of what's done now. Have you done that? Do you have any tips for, for self-taping auditions? Yeah, I think the difficult thing about this question is that the industry is in the middle of a massive transformation. And, you know, people coming into the industry now are not really going to be going in for auditions unless it's theatre. That is still happening. But pretty much everything else is now self tape. When I became an actor, every time you met on a job, you would go into you know, the city centre of wherever you were and you would wait outside on chairs in a hallway and you would get called into a room and you would physically meet people. And like, there are huge downsides and upsides to that. And the new system where, you know, thousands of people, literally thousands of people can send tapes into a casting director is much more democratic for sure. Like everybody gets a shot, but it's really hard because you're essentially having to make a film of yourself. So you have to have the money to buy the equipment to do that you have to have the space in your home to do that you have to have the quiet like I've got kids like the quiet to do that it's really hard you know to find an hour you have to have someone to read with you have to often learn a lot more material because they feel less embarrassed about asking you to learn 20 pages on an email than they would asking you to do that face to face and there's a lot of things happening in the industry to try and recalibrate like equity and you know, the Actors Union are trying to talk to the Casting Directors Guild about how to protect actors from the system, which at the moment is like the balance is not right, you know, in terms of what actors are being asked to do. But all of that aside, sorry, this is a very long <laughs> answer. I think my main advice would be, I think the, the thing about self-taping is that you have to, you have to have a, a very strong sense, I think, of the jobs you really want to get. And, you know, if you are like new to an agency, they might send you a lot, you know, and they might feel like, you know, I have to put like, you know, two hours aside to do every single tape. But because there are so many, there's lots and lots of um, opportunities for tapes. I think you really have to know what are the ones you really want to do. And then, then you have to sort of, like pr- pr- potentially put time aside to prepare with another person. So that means rehearsing for the tape. And then when you have to go about recording it, like trying to find things like the best possible light that you can, like I prefer to do mine in daylight. So that means doing them in the middle of the day, because I think trying to create lighting setups in your home can be really challenging to say nothing of trying to find the equipment for that. I mean, it's lucky now because mainly you can just do them on your phone. Like when they started doing self tapes, like, 
the camera phones weren't good enough so you had to buy like av equipment to like shoot them in your home but now you can just do it so get a tripod they're quite cheap to buy stick your iphone in it i think it's better to have something where you can do it in daylight because i think it's the lighting is better and just put some time aside to try and practice with someone who's going to who's going to read with you because that will obviously help when you come, you know, if your friend comes in five minutes before you have to shoot it and they've never read it before, I think that that can affect the the material. So I wanted to ask you about uh, casting directors uh, and agents, because you mentioned, you know, at the beginning of your career, you sort of got your first part first and then all those things kind of came afterwards. Uh, but usually it would be the other way around. Do you have any advice for anyone um, you know what to look for in, in casting directors and how to interact with them or what to look for in an agent yeah so I didn't have the typical experience myself as an actor but I did when I became a writer so I can kind of apply that I think to both of them you have to make your own work so if you know if you if you are at drama school then you know agents will come to the end of year show but not everybody in your year will get an agent off the back of that um so you have to be prepared for that not happening particularly now i think where a lot of agents are cutting their lists you know um so i think uh you you have to be you have to go into it being prepared for the fact that you might have to make your own work and i you know, had tried to get a writing agent in my in my 20s. And even though I had, you know, well established career as an actor, it was it was hard, you know, I hadn't made anything, you know, so I was able to go off, make my short film, and then I was able to get representation as a writer after that. So quite a lot of people that I know didn't get representation having been at drama school or studying a, th a theatre studies degree. So they had to make their own work. So they had to either write something themselves or perform something you know, either at Edinburgh or at a different festival, or, you know, or they take over on a, pu a pub theatre and, and, and really just kind of, you, you, you have, you have to make your own work. That's the only real way that you can, that you can do it. There isn't like another side door. You have to have something to show people, you know, um, to say, look, I can, I can do it. And I, and not only can I do it, but I really, really, really want to as well. Um, so yeah, I, you know, for me, like writing screenplays and submitting them um, to writing agents in my 20s, like that wasn't doing it. It wasn't it wasn't until I went away, made a short film, edited it, submitted it to festivals, did, had to do all of that, like because I co-produced it, you know, like had to to do all of that effort to like come up with a piece of work at the end of it. I could show show to people and say, like, I made that top, middle and bottom, I made the whole thing myself, um, that was enough to make people go, okay, now you can, yeah, I'm prepared to kind of take you on. Because I get, you know, it's a huge amount for somebody to represent you. It's a huge amount of work. And yeah, you have to prove to them that you're going to be worth their, their time and effort. And I think that's interesting. People might not realise that you have to have or or at least it's conventional to have a, a different agent for acting and then a different agent for sort of writing and directing. What feels like is the difference to you between how, how those two agents work with you? Um, yeah, so I um, mean, it, it's, it's not conventional to if you are represented, because not everybody chooses to have a representation by an agent or needs it necessarily. But if you are represented by an agent, then it's not conventional for an acting agent to represent writers or directors. They are specialised jobs and they're different jobs and quite often they're different agencies as well. So you have some agencies who represent actors and writers and directors, but some agencies only represent writers or only represent actors. You know, they they don't they don't sort of cross pollinate as it were uh, so that's something worth knowing and I think um, the advantage the way that those jobs are different is that an acting agent you, you know my my acting agent represents only actors she doesn't represent uh, actors um, writers and directors as well like they tend to be very specialized so that will be you know when I talk to them about you know jobs and meetings and like sort of my career trajectory I tend not to really talk about the other side of what I'm doing at all you know and similarly with my writing and directing agents you know my, my acting work is kind of completely separate you know it's possible to have a manager that's more of the American system where that person might represent you more holistically they might think about you as an actor writer director and you might talk about your career and the kind of work that you want to make more as a whole but that's not so common in this country but I think it's also worth saying, you know, particularly to people who are starting out, that representation is not the be all and end all. You don't have to have representation. Like it's harder if you're an actor, 
But, you know, particularly if you're a writer director and you want to make your first piece of work, like lots of really great filmmakers who've made their first film in, the, in this country that I'm familiar with in the last 10 years did not have representation when they made their first piece of work. Um, you know, even, even a feature length, you know, if you want to make a film, you can make a film. You don't need to have an agent to do it. Like, yeah, it's hard. And sometimes you're gonna have to do contracts and that's difficult and you, you know, like, you you know you you might want to have a producer like I think it's really hard to not have a producer like to be doing making a film without without anyone to sort of help you with that kind of side of things financing and contracts and things like that is hard but you know given that you probably won't individually make any money like do you really need to have an agent necessarily when you're making writing or directing your first film I mean that's you know, that's kind of up for debate. I mean, yes, that person becomes more important if you become a filmmaker who works regularly, particularly if you're like directing television where you might be, you know, going up for jobs all the time, you know, to direct episodes of other people's work, which isn't something that I'm, you know, I've, I, I'm familiar with, but that's a lot of directing is like sitting into other people's visions because you're directing episodic television, then yes, you definitely need to be represented for that. But if you want to make a feature and you're going into it for the first time, you don't necessarily, you don't necessarily need an agent when you start. So you mentioned, uh, you know, sort of the variety of jobs and the lots of jobs that sort of come to you at the beginning of your career. You've had, uh, you know, a really varied career. You've done sort of period dramas, you've done sci-fi, you've done Shakespeare on stage, but you've also done contemporary plays as well. Um, was this variety always quite purposeful for you? Were you wanting to do lots of different things? Yeah, I think, I mean, like I've, I've been in search of variety, but I think... Um, as particularly as my career has progressed, I think I've been less worried about variety and more just concerned with quality. You know, I think I am really interested in doing work and telling stories that I feel has some sort of, um, you know, real relevance to something, you know, or like uh, is attached to a kind of social political issue or has a kind of a uh, real creative voice behind it you know I really like working with with creatives writers and directors who have strong visions and that those are the kinds of jobs that I've always found the most rewarding I'm not sure that like variety for its own sake is the thing that is most intriguing to me I mean I would work in one genre over and over and over again if it meant that I could work with really interesting writers and directors much more than I would sort of consciously choose to kind of switch in and out of things also there are lots of things I can't do like I just don't think I could be in an action movie because <laughs> I'm just like very unfit <laughs> or like I couldn't do a musical like you know there so there are some things which I just you know by like just lack of talent <laughs> I'm not able to do um but also yeah I just you know I just want to work with people who I think are interesting and I think that that's probably the best the best way to kind of get the most out of the career that you you know the most enjoyment out of your career great and in everything that you've done sort of performance wise uh, film television on stage are there any projects which were sort of quite transformative for you where you sort of you learned a lot about yourself or you particularly developed your acting craft while while you were on them yeah loads I mean I had to learn <laughs> all of my acting craft on the job because I had no acting craft at the beginning um I think I had a really amazing, I've had a few experiences on screen which have really informed me. I think the difference between, the difference between a director on screen who directs um, material, they use that word, and somebody who like is a storyteller is a big difference. And when I was sort of relatively young, when I was just starting out, I worked with a French director called Francois Ozon, who made a film called Angel. And, you know, he, he, Francois Ozon's, um, uh, you know, he's a great director and he's, he's a storyteller. He doesn't sort of direct individual scenes so much as kind of uh, want, he's just very engaged in the entire narrative and he's like extremely collaborative and very creative and artistic and I think you know for me at that time in my career where I was sort of not really sure that I wanted to be an actor to have someone say to me this is a tremendous responsibility not opportunity responsibility you know like the, you know he would write these script the screenplay this is my screenplay that I labored over 
now I'm asking you to bring it to life. Like it really matters, you know, this isn't just about like, you know, flopping about doing a job that's easy for a few years until you can do something else Like you have to do it. You know, you're an important part in kind of storytelling. And that, that really made me realize that, you know, when you're an actor, you carry the writer's 10 years of effort in your hands you carry the directors you know two years of effort all of the people the producers everybody has come with the story and then it's handed over to you at this really important part moment in time um and there have been lots of kind of other examples like that but I think that was the first time that I really realized that it was something that I did want to do and also something that was important and valuable and a, a really good insight into directing there sort of as well um to talk about directing you directed your first short in uh, 2012 called scrubber how did that come about when did you decide actually i'm going to give this a go so i was 28 and i had always wanted to direct or for i had wanted to direct for a number of years uh, and I'd been writing for quite a long time, but everything that I wrote was just so terrible. I just, you know, I was writing and kind of just, you know, writing short films or trying to write features and just immediately just thinking, well, I have no talent, I've got no ability, so I just won't try. And then I think it was coming up to my 30th birthday and I thought, you know, this is really, a, a, that I have a fear of failure, a tremendous fear of failure, which is not, I think a good reason not to do something, um, particularly if you are a creative person and you want to make work, like that is a good enough reason, you know? And who's to say whether it's good or bad or not? So I set myself a goal to have made a short film by the time I was 30. I was very fortunate because I was able to fund my short myself. So that again is not necessarily representative of where most people or what most people will be able to do with their first short film I mean like maybe you'll get lucky and your aunt you know your great aunt will die or like you know your your parents will give you a bit of money but like if you don't then you have to apply for money but I was able to take some money that I'd earned and spend it on making my first short film which I really did I mean my friend produced it um so we did kind of almost completely outside the kind of um normal industry we met people through shooting people which is a, a website where you can connect with other kind of crew and creatives I got a couple of my friends who were actors to appear in it it was very much like something that I was just doing for myself because I thought if I don't try I'll never you know uh, uh, uh you just you just don't know and so that's how we made the film. And then, you know, we sent it off to a few festivals because we thought, well, why not? And then it got, got into some festivals, which was amazing. It was in Sundance, it was in Edinburgh, um, it was in the London Short Film Festival. Uh, and that was really when I think things started to kind of shift for me. And I really realized that actually it was something I did really want to do. And just because, you know, I'd written like 10 things that really didn't work, that isn't going to say that you're not going to write one thing that does work. And it kind of gave me more confidence and um, yeah. And then set me off on the course to kind of start writing features. Great. And you mentioned that your, your producer was a friend and that there were other friends that you sort of brought in. Like, how important do you think it is having a kind of a community and a network to help you create art like that? I think it is so important. I think there are other mediums where you can like be a visual artist or a musician maybe and just make work on your own. But I think in film or in television, it's really hard. Like you need to find the other people who get you, who get your taste, who, you know, who want to make work, who have a similar passion for it. Um, actors really, really need the support of other actors because it's such a hard industry. I think it's really, really important to find those people. And if they're not at your school, if they're not at their college, if, you're, if they're not in your family, like go out and find them because <laughs> they're there. And, you know, that's not only how you make work, but also how you just walk around in the world and don't feel like a weirdo, you know, like you need, <laughs> you need to have other people who, you know, I particularly like quite strange cinema, like, you know, no one else in my sort of family does. Like I needed to go out and find people who also like that kind of work to validate in a way my own preferences. And then, you know, as, as I said, that also enabled me 
to to ask those people to be involved in making a, a short film because even a short film you can't make it on your own you can't you physically can't do it you need you know somebody to help you produce it that means running a budget that means you know not only just getting all the people involved to help you make it on the day like the cameraman and everything but you need an editor you need someone to help you with sound like it's a, it's a even a short film you know is a whole world and you can't do it all on your own it sounds like there's so much advice that you would give to someone who's like embarking on that journey but if you could just boil it down to sort of a few tips what would be the advice you'd give to someone who's thinking about doing a short film think about your budget first and foremost that is like the most (laughs) boring thing (laughs) but that is honestly like if you have a hundred pounds to make a short film then you have to shoot it on your phone and you have to get your friends to do it and you have to edit it yourself on your laptop so that is going to be one kind of film there's no reason you can't make a great film that way you absolutely can if you've got five grand you know like if you've been given that money by someone then you you know then you can get equipment then you can lean on people, you can ring up Ari or Panavision, then you can you know, go on shooting people, then you have a budget, but there's no point trying to make a science fiction short film if you don't have any money. If you don't have any money, then that means you have to make something that is reliant on you know, spaces that you can get, your own home, your friends, your family, things that, you know, and then you have to think about like, well, what are the what is the story that I can tell from that is it something that's happened to a friend of mine is it something that's happened to me is it an incident that I saw on the bus like you have and you know and I'm still doing that to this day when I sit down to write a feature film there's no point me writing a 60 million you know pound movie that's set in space that requires thousands of intergalactic soldiers you know you have to think about how much money you have in film like that is a big difference with other art forms you know it's different from music it's different from visual art it's 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 very much a practical medium but that doesn't mean thank goodness that we live in the days we do that you can't just you know you you if you have iMovie then you can you can cut your own film and that is you know that's like a a, a brilliant thing about the world that we live in today but you kind of have to start off thinking that and then I guess the other thing that I would say which is as important as the practical is just you know why is your story important what is the story you want to tell and why is it important because you have to have a reason to tell it you know it's it's so hard to make work it's so hard to write a screenplay to make the time to do it to cut it to to you know, have the balls to go out and ask people for money, to ask your friends to give up their Saturdays to be part of it. You have to believe that the story means something, not just to you, but to the world. I really, I really think that. So whatever story you're telling, you just, yeah, you really need to know that it is important to you and that, you know, you have something to say. And when you made Scrubber, uh, did your approach to acting change having been in the director's chair? Yeah, I think it it really did. I would say that was with my short, you know, it was three days, the shoot. So it wasn't such a big shift. Um, although, you know, it was useful for me to see acting, particularly to see editing for the first mm-hmm. time, because I don't think I'd ever really understood as an actor how little control I had over the end product. Um but it was really my feature where I think I really understood that the, you know, the your your role as an actor is tremendously important in telling the story. But the story itself can can be completely changed in the edit. <laughs> and so, you know, if you want to be the best collaborator possible, then you can you you can and should give the director uh, options, uh, and the best the best directors will ask you for options because they'll you know understand that a story can be told so many different ways depending on so many tiny little decisions that you make in the edit and um yeah it really it it really enhanced my belief that it was a valuable thing to be to be acting and also yeah really made me feel that I could afford to try and do quite different things on the day when I was acting because you know if 
you know, if a director gets to the edit and you've given them three or four different things to play with, then that's um, that's a real a benefit to them. Let's talk about Amulets because, uh, you know, that's your, your first feature film. How did you go from Scribber to Amulet? And, and did you go directly from Scribber to Amulet or were there other projects and stuff that happened in between? No, I did not go directly <laughs> from Scrubber to Hamlet. There were many failed projects in between and I had two children as well. So like life gets in the way of, of, um, of, of that journey. I think, it, yeah, it's, the move from a short to a feature is, is difficult. It's, it's not totally straightforward. And I think for me, it was um, particularly about looking and seeing what opportunities were opening up and how I could kind of fit into them. Because after making Scrubber, I had a feature that was in development for a while, which was a supernatural film. It was like a period ghost story set in the 1950s. Um, it was quite a strange film, it's quite unusual, didn't fit into a kind of very specific genre box. And yeah, I mean, I think people liked it and I did a lot of work on it and rewrote it loads and loads of times, but, it just was maybe a bit too expensive <laughs> talking about money again. And then also, I think it was a story I really passionately believed in, but I found it, it was not that uplifting. And I found it very hard, you know, when you go in to have meetings with production companies and producers, they want to know that like they're giving audiences something that they can, you know, leave feeling on a high about, or if they leave feeling angry about, or if they like, but if they just leaving feeling sad, like it's that, you know, I get it. Like that's, that's hard. Um, but it was difficult for me to let that story go. And I think one thing I would say that I've really had to learn is that it's not a good idea to just have one script that you have poured your heart and soul into, that you are walking around giving to people. And every time they say they don't like it, it's like your heart being broken, you know, like, don't do that. I did that. It's a really bad idea. Like try and write in lots of different genres, like write different mediums. Like if you've never tried to write a romantic comedy, it doesn't mean you can't like try and write one, like write four or five different screenplays, even if they are all in the same genre, like have different pieces of work. Cause not only will it make you a better writer because you will have you know just been physically writing for more and more and longer but also it will be less painful I think when the inevitable process of kind of rejection which is like 90% of what the job, job is you know when that happens because you think oh well that's one project that that one person didn't like but then there's all of these other things that I have going as well so then I started to branch out into like writing different kinds of screenplays and like diversifying a bit. And that was when I somebody actually said to me, have you tried writing a horror film? And by then I was much more receptive to writing kind of things that I wasn't that familiar with as well, I wasn't that familiar with as an actor. I, I obviously loved and watched many horrors myself um, over the years, but I that was when I tried to write Amulet. And immediately there was a kind of beginning of a kind of growth in, in horror. And it was going through a sort of the beginning of a kind of golden age of horror. And immediately that was, that was optioned by a producer and went into development really quickly. And we were able to finance that film and just the whole thing happened much more quickly and much smooth, much more smoothly than it had for, for any, of, any of the other things I'd written. <laughs> There are many like you, Thomas, who seek refuge here. This is Magda. Her mother lives on the top floor. She's very ill. Why me? You're a builder, right? That's what you said? You try to make things bearable for them. She needs companionship. Mother won't like it. Magda is young, Thomas. She could become attached. What's wrong with her? It has to be this way. I'm afraid. Did you kill people in the war? 
What is happening to me? Do you see it? Do you see it? Do you know what a demon is? She belongs to it. How are you, Thomas? Settling in? And what was the jump from short to, to feature like uh, as a director? Is there anything that you sort of wish you knew going into doing your first feature film? Yeah, there was just, it's just such an enormous, it's such an enormous jump. It's like, it's like doing a school sports day and then going to the Olympics. I was like, I mean, it's, it's an enormous jump. Um, I think particularly, I think I set myself up for quite a difficult journey because my short was, you know, it was, it was actors and it was a very simple story in some ways about a married couple and, the you know, trying to like have a like a date together and they can't she the the mother can't find childcare you know it was you know a relatively simple story and as i said before it was sort of simple to shoot and simple to make because you know that's um those were the resources that we had but when you write a horror film like my film had practical effects in it so it had puppets in it and it had um CGI in it and it had um I had to work with actors doing choreography who were wearing prosthetics like there were a lot more sort of technical things in it which I really just knew no, absolutely nothing about beforehand like I'd read lots of things online I'd read lots of books I'd you know some directors had kindly given up their time to kind of talk me through but essentially I was going into them completely cold uh so the fact that I had directed a short film like six or seven six years previously in a completely different medium wasn't necessarily that much of a help and it was it was a huge jump but the thing that that I realized very quickly which um a lot of people said to me is that um i you're not you know when you're a director you are not really doing a lot of the jobs you are collaborating with people so i had an incredible director of photography so you know me not really knowing the best way to light prosthetics was not something that I needed to know. My director of photography, Laura, needed to know that. And she did know that because she <laughs> is an amazing director of photography. And I was, you know, really scared and worried about how to, you know, work with practical effects. But, you know, we obviously had somebody who made the practical effects and that was their area of expertise. You know, similarly, the production designer and the, you know, the, the composer to, and the editor, like I was able to compile, like come together with a team of people to make the film. And that is one of the most important things you do as a director is that you find people who share your aesthetic taste, who like the things that you like to watch, who like to listen to the same kinds of music if you're working with a composer, who enjoy the same kinds of films. Basically, it's about finding those people who get what you get and working with, with them really closely. So when you were talking about um, developing Amulet and your, you know, your other screenplay that that didn't get made, you talked about, you know, rejection and sort of 90 percent of the game is is the rejection. Um, it strikes me that that's familiar for acting as well as directing. Like you need a lot of resilience and patience to go into into this industry. Do you have any sort of general tips about how people can prepare themselves for for that? It's really good to have another job. <laughs> I found it much easier to deal with the rejection in acting since I started writing and directing and I have a lot of friends who teach and I have other friends who do completely unrelated jobs but I think it is you know unless you're in the kind of 0.0001% of actors who just go from job to job to job or oh, and are also able to kind of select their work which is not representative of almost everybody in the industry it is a psychologically demanding profession like it's hard on your mental health because people say no all the time and sometimes they make up a nice reason and sometimes they say some really mean things and you have to kind of and it's hard you know and it it doesn't necessarily get easier but what does help I think is having a rich and full life which prepares you mentally for the job so that's 
you know, making sure that you when you're not acting that you have other things to do like I basically keep office hours now I'm writing when I'm not acting you know like the 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 other people that I know also have branched out into other parts of the industry like lots of actors are involved in casting as well or they produce work there's lots of producers you know so they they have a kind of diversity of different things that they do as well as acting um and yeah and then sort of more in terms of sort of specifically to do with the rejection of it I just think it's really important that when you go into it you have a really close relationship with the work that you do individually and to take that aside from way the way that other people feel about it like lots of actors don't read their reviews at all and I think that's a really good thing to do because if you invest in whether other people think you've done a good job or not then you also have to invest in like them thinking that you're not good enough for a role and so it's really important I think to sometimes just say I went and did an audition and I did a really good job and I was happy with the work that I did in that audition and not really and take that aside from whether or not you got the job or not um and you know I did an audition the other day and I wasn't happy with what I did in the room and it was really nothing to do with whether they offered it to me or not I just didn't feel like I'd nailed it for myself and to kind of just end up with a very kind of specific and individual sense of your work and your relationship to it that is aside from everything else you know because quite often when you don't get a job it's absolutely nothing to do with whether you did a good job in the meeting or not but they maybe just wanted somebody with dark hair or somebody who was five years older or they're to do with all these random things that you can't control anyway and so it's really unhelpful to internalize that rejection I think that's such good advice thank you uh, so much I wanted to ask about writing because you sort of touched on this a bit when you said with Amulet you know you thought oh yes you know I'll, I'll venture into horror and I'll um I'll try writing a horror how do you sort of develop uh, these ideas and sort of flex your creativity muscles like how do you sort of start writing how do you put that pen to paper and get going well it's a really interesting question and I think about that a lot sometimes I get a lot of ideas <laughs> too many um but sometimes you can have an idea and it drops into your head and you I you know like I just have a phone now but I used to have a notebook all the time but now I just you know, I'll be like driving in the car or in the supermarket and I'll be like, oh, uh, a woman who has a twin buried inside her that's controlling, you know, like I'll just have an idea for something and I'll jot, jot it down. And I think for me, what's interesting is not so much that the ideas coming themselves, it's sometimes those ideas turn into screenplays and sometimes they don't. And I think that's really hard to know when something you know, has the ability to turn into an entire narrative, you know, because a really important th thing that I had to learn is don't even start writing until you know what happens at the end. There is no point, you know, just don't even begin. It's wasting your time. Like before you've written anything down or typed anything down, like run through the story in your head, the whole story, the beginning, what happens at the middle and the end. Um, because, you know, I spent years wasting my time thinking I would really like to write something set in 18th century Italy, you know, and then I would write 10 or 15 pages and then I would realize I didn't have a story and I would get lost and confused and I wouldn't and I didn't have an ending and then I would give up and hate myself, you know, like so it's it's just thinking time is really important. Knowing the whole story before you start writing is really important and um and I think that's what makes the difference between an idea and a story. Great. I think there might be a lot of people watching who perhaps, you know, they may be actors, but they're interested in directing or they may be doing other things that they've done on film sets or student sets, but they're, they're interested in uh, directing. What's your advice to anyone who finds themselves on a set, uh, whether it's professional or like I say, a student set, and they're interested in directing. Is there anything that you can do in another role to sort of help develop uh, skills and knowledge about directing? So do you mean like if somebody went and was acting in something, how would they learn about directing? Yeah, yeah. If you find yourself on a set in, as a performer or in a different role, how what could you do to learn about directing from that position? Um, I think I, I mean, I learned a lot about directing Thing from being an actor a lot about the things that I really liked about directors and a lot about the things I didn't like about directors <laughs> from being an actor so it's really useful but also 
But you also, do you know what? It's also unhelpful as well, because something that I found really important to learn about directing is that, and I'm hesitant to say this to sort of young people going into the industry, but it's not the director's job to make everyone happy, you know? And I think that, you know, when you're an actor, you expend an awful lot of energy I think particularly this is probably true for women in the industry, women and girls in the industry, like being nice and not being a diva and never being a problem, you know, like that's a big pressure that you feel. And actually it's, that's of course completely true for men as well in the industry, because, you know, actors are quite precarious in the industry. So you just go to set and you want to be super nice to everyone and not be a problem. And, you know, so the kind of misconception about actors and divas, I think is like, 180 degrees the opposite of the reality like actors never want to be a problem you know and actually it's kind of the director's job to be a problem sometimes because you know when they come to you and they say so this is the car that the character is driving for the getaway and you're like it's a micro <laughs> and they're like yeah that's all we could get sometimes you have to say it can't be a micro it has to be a different car and that makes you a nightmare and people are going to roll their eyes and they're going to say you're being difficult I mean the trick is not to kind of take this you know too far like you don't want to be an asshole you know and like you have to know when no means no but also you have to push back a lot because it's your job because you're the person who can shut their eyes and see the whole film in their head you are the only person that can do that so you know, sometimes you got to make yourself unpopular. Whereas I think for actors, you know, like you never want to be on, <laughs> you want everybody to say it's been wonderful to work with you because you always want to get another job. Um, but the opposite is often true for directing. And anyone who's uh, watching this, who's interested in directing and perhaps at the start of their career, um, you know, is there anything that you'd recommend watching any particular films that you found particularly inspiring that you're like, oh, you should watch this if you want to know about filmmaking? Oh, well, yeah, I mean, so, so much, right? Um, where to start? Like, I guess um, the films that I think for me really sort of helped me to understand like the, the kind of... Um, the specificity of directing, the detail of directing are films that, where I feel like there's a kind of a complete world from the music to the cinematography, to the language, to the performance, you know, that there's a kind of complete synchronicity in those things. I saw Jane Campion's The Piano at quite an early age, and that had a huge impact on me. I think music and film are very intimately connected. And I think it's often a really, really good place to start is to think when you think about your idea, like before you're writing anything, when you've just got the idea in your head and start thinking about music straight away. I mean, that film, The Piano, is a lot about music, about the creation of music. But it's true for, you know, many great filmmakers. Kubrick is one of my favorite filmmakers. Cronenberg is one of my favorite filmmakers. And Dead Ringers is one of my favorite films. That's a film I saw when I was quite young that had a really big impact on me. And they all have really dramatic scores. And I feel like for them, the um, effect of listening to the music in some way helped them imagine the film, help them play out the film in their head, help set the tone. And then the images and the language and the performance style, all of those other things were able to sort of come from that. So yeah, I would say, um, well, those are a couple of sort of recommendations of filmmakers I really like, but also um, the importance of, of, of introducing music really, really at an early stage when you're, when you're writing or thinking about your ideas. I wanted to ask you one last question, which is if you're able to share, because I know obviously some things are, you know, have to be confidential and under wraps, but are you working on anything now? Are you going to be directing again or um, are you acting in anything soon? Well, I'm sort of at this annoying stage where there's sort of lots of things hopefully just about to go. So I can't I can't talk about anything in sort of too much detail, but the producer that I worked with on Amulet, um, Matt Wilkinson and I are working on a project uh, which I really hope is going to get to go soon because it's a film set in uh, London in the Restoration Theatre Land, all about a woman who uh, is 
um, a very unusual uh, character with a very unusual appearance uh, who decides to become a playwright. So it's all about sort of objectification and, you know, beauty versus talent and um, making uh, a name for yourself as a woman in in the in the world at that time of kind of uh, the, the sort of Renaissance theatre world. Um, so it's a bit of a sort of satire on the industry as well. And that's something I would really, really like to make. So, yeah, watch the space. Oh, that sounds very exciting. I can't wait to see it. Uh, well, thank you so much again for your time today and being so generous uh, with your answers. No worries. I hope it was of some help. <laughs> Thanks very much. <laughs> And thank you so much for watching at home. Romola Garay's Amulet is still playing in cinemas across the UK, so please check out your local listings if you haven't caught it already. And there are still two more days to go at the Future Film Festival. It's jam-packed with events, including panel discussions, masterclasses, workshops, both online and in person at the BFI South Bank. On Saturday at 3 p.m., we actually have a directing actors workshop with Judith Weston, whose students have included the likes of Ava DuVernay, Taika Waititi, Steve McQueen. Uh, this is another online event, so you can watch it here for free. Uh, if you're in London, we've got more of these hotspots happening at the BFI South Bank, including with Craig Roberts. Uh, so don't miss those either. You can buy tickets and check out what other events we have in store on the Future Film Festival website and by following the Film Academy social channels. Thank you again for watching. Bye bye.